as well as the next three events was chosen by parents at previous events. Um, we felt that um, what we heard from people is that mental health and wellness of our students, staff and parents and general public <laughs> um, is certainly an important part normally, but especially in this past year as well. Um, so tonight I look forward to learning a little more about what's going on in the schools and also maybe come away with some ideas for myself for home and for supporting my kids at home as well too. So tonight we welcome Piali Bagchi, Mental Health and Wellness Lead, Katie Boyd, School Social Worker, and Rachel G, School Child and Youth Worker. Um, so I'll be keeping track of any questions that may come up during the presentation um, and we can uh, talk about those at the end. Um, and before I start, um, Trustee Sloat, are you prepared to do um, to read the land acknowledgement? Thank you. The Grand Erie District School Board recognizes the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples as the traditional peoples of this territory. We acknowledge and give gratitude to the Indigenous peoples for sharing these lands in order for us to continue our work here today. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Carol Ann, uh, and thank you, Sarah, for introducing us. Let me uh, share my screen uh, and we'll begin the presentation. All right. So you should be seeing now in front of you um, the PowerPoint. Can you guys uh, see that? It's coming, yes. Uh, okay, great. And just a second and I'll take it off. I'll put it onto um, slideshow. Great. Okay, so I'll talk, I'll talk about this in just a second. So yes, this is very much what we're hoping tonight. We're hoping that you and, and obviously uh, in your roles, you can definitely talk to others because you're all influencers in your own ways about um, mental health services uh, and supports for students in Grand Erie. I will tell you that uh, since COVID, um, we have not reduced our mental health services, but instead what we've tried to do is we've actually tried to be responsive uh, to the changes and the challenges that have occurred in all of our lives as a result of this pandemic. And we will, through the presentation, give you lots of examples of things that we're doing to do that. Um, I, Sort of, I did want to uh, thank you all for attending. And just as a clarification, I know we're a small group, but when it comes to questions, we can't actually answer any uh, individual or personal questions about mental health within this kind of a forum. Um, but if there are questions when we come out of this, if there is something that you hoped um, would be answered, or if there's a question that you still have, my email is right there and uh, feel free uh, to email me. Uh, I am, I have been very, very busy these uh, last couple of months, um, but certainly I will flag it and I will respond to you. And you know that uh, you'll be getting this PowerPoint as well as the event is being recorded. So I wanna give you a quick overview, what we're gonna to do tonight. So I'm gonna talk in general, first of all, about mental health services, so you can understand how they're structured within the board. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the tiered process to mental health services. So that's the foundation um, that we do our work, right? So there is organizational structure to how we do our work. And then Katie uh, and Rachel will talk adeptly about security, belonging and hope, and the important role that they play in us being mentally healthy. And she will talk, or they will both talk about mental health promotion, targeted prevention and intervention. Um, we'll take a short break, and then we'll finish off the evening talking about something we've been working on for months, which is um, a uh, rollout we're gonna do during Mental Health Week called the Five Ways to Wellbeing. So that's, that's the work for the evening. So let me talk first about the foundational pieces. So when we talk about mental health within a school board, um, just to ensure common language, we're really talking about student well-being, about being mentally healthy. And when we talk about being mentally healthy, we talk about the physical, the cognitive, the social, and the emotional. 
uh, our indigenous partners have always sort of connected the body and the mind and the spirit. And they have their own mental health uh, wellness continuum and they have recognized uh, the important purpose of meaning, purpose, belonging and hope. And we actually come back to some of those uh, same themes ourselves as we um, will talk tonight. So what do we hope for? What do we want to happen? What are we striving for? Well, this is how we'd like, this is our aspirational goal. We think that schools are an, opt, are an optimal place for positive mental health, to build student social emotional skills, to reduce stigma, to encourage help seeking behaviors. We want to be able to identify students who are in need. We want to offer, and we do offer, um, prevention and intervention services to students who are at higher risk. And we have pathways to, from, and through the school system and our community and our health services. So I wanted to give you a sense of the organizational structure from the province on down. So within the province, um, mental health services are funded. So every school has a mental health lead uh, such as me. There's also, and if you really want to see a website that is worth uh, spending some time and in investigating, it's the School Mental Health Ontario website. So at the provincial level, those are funded and those help support our work within the board. At the board level, we have a superintendent for well-being. Um, we, do, um, we do a lot as far as professional development um, for really for all ages and across staff. And we'll talk a lot about this tonight. We do mental health promotion, prevention, and intervention by our child and youth workers and our social workers. At the school level, we have the school teams, the resource teams. We've done, we've really um, moved the dial a lot with regards to um, classroom-based social emotional learning. We also do targeted prevention, and I'll talk a lot more about what these, what these terms mean. Um, counseling and crisis intervention. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the terms that I've been using. Oh, no, I'm gonna talk about this first, sorry. It takes a village. So we recognize that when we provide mental health services that we have to do it collaboratively with our community. So we have partnerships. We have, um, because that's part of my role, we have 31 partnerships um, across Haldeman, Norfolk, Brant, Six Nations and Mississauga of the Credit. We also have protocols with our um, hospitals and with our mental health and addiction nurse, nurses. So we, again, we believe in working collaboratively to meet students' uh, needs. So now I wanna talk about the structure. This is, this is how we've structured um, mental health services within uh, the Grand Jury School Board. It actually also aligns um, to how the ministry um, would like to see mental health services being delivered. Uh, and it also aligns with how our spec ed uh, delivers uh, services to students. So this is what's called a tiered mental health support. So our child and youth workers and our social workers provide services in each one of these tiered areas. So if I go to the bottom of that triangle and I look at tier one, Tier one is mental health promotion. We know there's been really at this point vast amounts of research which has shown that we can teach, we can teach students like young students, kindergarten students, positive mental health. And, and in fact, Rachel will talk a little bit about how we're doing some of that work. And this really, we know the research shows this very clearly that this is beneficial to all students because it helps them achieve at school and it helps them achieve their long-term personal goals. In the tier two, we do targeted prevention. So we recognize that there are kids who are more at risk. And for those kids and those students, we know that we need to do some smaller group work um, that is um, more targeted to the, to the practice the skill building, the coaching that they need. And at the tier three level, that's where we do our individualized assessments. These are our most vulnerable kids, and these are the students that require more coaching and more counseling. 
So I'm going to go back to the, the tiers again, but this time I'm going to apply it to the child and youth workers and the roles that they do. Uh, the role of the child and youth worker actually changed significantly about three years ago. And we are, and, and again, I'll, I know Rachel will talk about some of the benefits that we're starting to see from this. So our child and youth workers, they work primarily in tier one and tier two. So in tier one, our child and youth workers attend school teams. This is an important change that we made because you can have a school team, an, an administrator and an LRT, and a teacher can call a school team whenever they need to. And at the school team, the child and youth worker is there. And if there's a need, that is a place that they can discuss it. And then they can discuss what supports can be put in place. We talk about support starting in the classroom because we are focused on closer to the classroom supports. So there are many different programs that we run to support self-regulation and healthy relationships in the classroom. Again, this is common language, right? So that the teacher is present and all the students are learning these valuable skills. Um, the child and youth worker also supports families. Uh, in getting connected to community resources and provides other um, professional development that we'll talk about later. <laughs> in tier two, we provide targeted prevention. So again, we're back to the smaller group. So we might have done, or the child and youth worker might have done work in a whole classroom. Let's just, let's say a grade four classroom. But in her work, um, the teacher and her identify that Carol Ann, um, and, and Dave, um, as well as Pielli, could benefit from some additional um, practice, some additional role playing, uh, so that then they, they use the same language because the teacher and all the kids have learned this language, but they meet with these groups, smaller groups, and that gives them a chance to do more coaching and practice. Then at tier three, we notice that Pielli is still struggling. Pielli may have some learning difficulties. It may be some impulsivity. There may be some working memory issues. So this allows the child and youth worker to then coach her individually, maybe help with more scripting, maybe practice in the, in the places that, that she's really struggling with. So that's sort of an example of how it, how it plays out. Now I'm going to apply the tier process to our social workers. So our social workers per work primarily at tier three. That's primarily the work that, that they do, but they do do work in all of the tiers. So if we go back to the bottom of the triangle, tier one, our social workers attend a resource team meetings. So resource team meeting is a set uh, and it's a multidisciplinary team. So today in, with you at this meeting, there are, uh, there's a child and youth worker and a social, and a, a social worker, but um, within uh, Grand Dairy, we have psychology staff, speech and language, behavior counselors, communication disorders assistants, attendance counselors. At resource team is a multidisciplinary team. At tier one, our social workers can consult on mental health issues. Uh, they respond to traumatic events and they provide professional development such as SIS and Safe Talk. At tier two, now tier two work we haven't been able to do. Well, we just started actually, we're gonna start in a week, but we haven't been able to do the small targeted group at the high schools that we had started in previous years. And that actually is more of a decision based on safety and pandemic and, and the way kids are learning. But certainly I will tell you a couple of years ago, we started to run smaller groups um, for our high school students. Um, to support anxiety and um, talk about healthy relationships. So as I already said, our, our social workers, um, they work within tier three and there they do counseling, they do the suicide risk assessments, they refer to the mental health and addictions nurses, they do community-based referrals and they do support plans um, for students to help them be um, successful in school. So we will come back to this. We'll come back to it throughout the presentation. We'll just continue to talk about it and give you examples related to it. I'm, I've added this slide as well. And this slide talks about our Grand Erie's Grand Mental Health Strategy 
and that we do work in mental health literacy, in wellness and resiliency, and we do lots of work with interventions. Like I said, we do counseling, we connect families to community agencies. We will talk about some of the professional development we do. Um, we have a suicide risk protocol that defines our work in that area, which is very strong and evidence-based. We do crisis intervention, traumatic response, and we work with our community partners. So that is actually my uh, piece. I'm going to uh, send uh, or I'm going to let um, Katie start, um, but I wanted to briefly introduce uh, the next section. The next section talks about security, belonging, and hope. Uh, at the beginning of this school year, um, we provided some um, mental health professional development uh, to our uh, administrators who then provided it to their staff. And we focused, uh, given the kind of year, you know, the way that last year ended and the way this year was, was beginning, we really talked about the importance of security, belonging, and hope as our students returned. And we uh, provided them actually with a number of different resources. So um, for this presentation, we'll give you again more examples, um, but we come back to those important themes. And I will let Katie take over at this point. Thank you, Pia. Um, so yeah, I'm Katie Boyle and um, I mostly work out of Haldimand, um, but I also have a couple Brantford schools, but my office is located in Hagersville, so that's sort of where the area I'm in. Um, this resource here on the screen is something that was developed by uh, the mental health team um, that was provided to admin for parents um, for the second shutdown of school, so uh, from December until February, and it's rooted in this idea of security belonging and hope because they're so intrinsically linked to mental well-being. Um, we'll start with security because uh, if it's foundations in, um, in mental health. So pick it at the next slide, please. Uh, so here we see um, Abraham Maslow is a positive psychologist and he came up with this sort of um, hierarchy of human needs. So we can see uh, the down at the bottom are the biological and physical needs, your really basic food, water, shelter, and then right above it is safety. So even in this picture, we can see how important it is um, in order to be feeling well. Um, safety as a primary need, um, Maslow argued that a person will seek out safety prior to being able to access any of those needs above. Um, so it's really a foundation um, a way that young people, especially, um, it shapes the way that they formulate the world around us. So when I work with students, just an ex as an example, um, that more struggle with anxiety, their core belief, which is sort of a term we use in cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, is that the world around me is unsafe. Um, so I use a metaphor that if you're walking around with glasses on that have colored lenses that are blue, um, everything around you is going to look that way. So if the kind of core belief is that the world is unsafe, that's going to shape the way that these kids are um, interacting with the people around them and their environment. Um, so really important as far as the foundation of a person. Um, so if you can see the next slide, we're going to delve a little bit deeper into the neuroscience behind how the brain responds to stress. So this is the science portion of the of the presentation. Um, on the left hand side of the image uh, of the graphic there, you can see the unstressed brain. So where a stimulus happens, an event, a person, an image um, comes into the brain. Um, you can see the front part, uh, the prefrontal cortex takes in this information and then sort of decides what to do with it. Um, so when this brain here is not under stress, we see it's taking in information. The person has tight control over their thoughts, emotions, and actions. Again, all the things that we're looking at um, when we're doing CBT. Um, and then on the right-hand side, the stress brain, um, this image actually includes the amygdala on the screen. So uh, a good way of thinking about that is like a barcode scanner that instantly processes information and then decides what to do with it. Uh, another way that people think about the amygdala is like a smoke alarm, that when it decides something is a threat, uh, it's sending a signal to the hypothalamus to start the body's stress response. 
um, and actually a really great resource to um, understand this whole system a little bit better, the body's response to stress. Uh, I have a link at the bottom of the screen. Um, it's Harvard's website um, of understanding the stress response. And it really does a great job of explaining this whole how uh, the body responds to a, a stressor. Um, so when you have this stress response, it's kicking in your adrenal system, all those sorts of physical effects of stress we see. Um, and then it's activating your sympathetic nervous system. I liked this idea of the gas pedal taking over and sending out your hormones, those bad stress hormones like cortisol. Um, and we see that fight or flight response. So when we have the gas pedal just continuously going and going, um, then you see them um, with all the red arrows going all over the place. So imagine how difficult it's going to be for a young person to recall memory um, to process their emotions, to engage with other kids and make rational decisions, all those sorts of things. Um, they don't have control, as much control around their thoughts, emotions, and actions. And this is happening within milliseconds um, between the time that the brain is perceiving a threat to the time when we're responding with our bodies. Um, but if a person's able to use those calming skills or other strategies, then it's activating the parasympathetic nervous system or the brake pedal. Um, now, the adolescent brain, the amygdala, uh, or sorry, the, um, the prefrontal cortex is in a state of great growth and development between like ages 10 and 25. Um, and in the prefrontal cortex, not only is it shaping, kind of storing those memories, but it's doing things like attention impulse control, future thinking. So for those of us that are caring for or knowing teenagers or people in their early 20s would explain why these people are often doing really dumb things um, because they don't always have the ability to think out, if I do this, this is the consequence of what's gonna happen and the impulsivity is there. So sometimes it's not totally their fault, their brain is still growing. Um, but what it really boils down to is, is an understanding that when young people don't feel safe, it can be really difficult for them to learn, to use problem solving skills, to regulate their emotions. Um, and we know that especially now feeling secure can be even more difficult than ever before. But we can help young people to feel secure by teaching them and practicing self-regulation and also co-regulation. Um, so that will be the next slide, please. Um, this is a really great depiction of how when their storm meets our calm, co-regulation occurs and the waters have calmed down. Um, so knowing that this is maybe um, recorded, maybe just audioly, audio, maybe just the audio is being recorded, um, I've talked with my hands, so I'll try and say kind of here and here, use levels as opposed to using my hands, but the way that I kind of think about this um, is just at home, my own experience. So I have four-year-old twins and an eight-year-old, and I'm like by no means the perfect parent, don't get me wrong. But when the kids are bickering and fighting or someone gets hurt and they're coming to me wailing and crying, every time I'm able, so they're coming to me up here, like at a level two, every time I'm able to meet them here, I find it instantly makes them feel better, helps them to calm down. Um, easier and faster. The times when I'm not able to, to co-regulate as much, especially when I'm tired, if I'm meeting them where they're at and saying, what are you doing or what's going on? Um, it always makes it worse. And even more so if I'm really tired or stressed and I'm meeting them up here, when I really lose my cool, then they cry. I get upset feeling guilty being the bad mom. You know, then I'm up here and then they see me upset. And it's just this whole process of going up from level two to level three and so on and so on. Um, so, again, I'm not able to do this all the time. Don't get me wrong there. But anytime I've noticed that I'm able to meet them down here, go down to their eye level, talk calmly in a calm voice, um, sort of validate what their feelings are and then help them to solve the problem. Um, I'm modeling calls for them. I'm helping to alleviate the situation. Um, and then we're all regulating together as opposed to kind of drowning in the waters that we see in the first picture. So next slide, I'm going to explain how we do that within our school board, that co-regulation process um, and helping with feeling secured, feeling secure. So down in tier one, um, I put for all of this, just this idea of modeling calm. So 
Um, as Piali mentioned, part of our role in traumatic events response um, is just an example of when people's uh, feelings and emotions and energy can be really heightened. So it's walking through that building with an awareness of my body language, how fast I'm walking, um, my tone of voice, just all those sorts of things, and really being a model for calmness. And you can see that it trickles down to the principal, to the staff members, to the students and families in the school. Um, so it really requires for you to sort of be aware of what you're bringing in and the energy that you have. Um, but modeling calm is something that we do from in every single tier. Uh, Rachel is going to be speaking more about the child and youth workers role and all the great things they've been doing as far as security at school. But it just involves things like their uh, video series. They did ones they're on YouTube around um, suicide prevention, bullying prevention. Um, there's some social media safety presentations that can be done at the classroom level. Uh, staff was given uh, professional development on self-regulation. Um, our safe and inclusive school team was doing a webinar for staff around youth substance use in COVID-19 and giving them some um, input and interventions to do at school. Um, and then uh, our wellness check referrals. I'm gonna talk more about that on the next slide. Um, in tier two, our uh, safe and inclusive schools team is also able to do some restorative practices when there's been either conflict or issues coming up between groups or when that's needed at school to build safety. And then as Piali mentioned, I, I live up in tier three for most of my role. So that's where lots of what the social work team is doing. Um, again, supporting with the traumatic events response. We have our violent threat risk assessment um, this year, we developed a COVID response team to support schools um, with positive COVID cases. Uh, we, the social workers, are doing risk assessment um, for things like suicidal ideation and self-harm. Um, we have a consultation kind of process just with schools. So if a principal has a question around safety or a concern, they can call me on my cell phone and talk through the situation. Um, I'm doing my short-term counseling with students at our highest identified needs, and then doing things like our re-entry to school following things like hospitalization. Um, the great thing for this year is that we were able to uh, provide some social work support, or not some, lots of social work support to students virtually, since we've had students that have been in our virtual learning academy, back at school, in and then um, also home for a school closure. So that's been a really important part of feeling secure and making sure that those students aren't just off in the world without eyes on them, not knowing how they or their families are doing. Katie, could I interrupt you for a minute? Sure. Um, thank you very much. This is this is very good. Um, I'm not I'm not clear. I, I'm in tier two, but I'm not clear what re a restorative practice is. Uh, I can I can get healthy relationships, but I I'm struggling with restorative practices. What that is? Okay, um, so a restorative practice would be one that's trying to repair a harm that's been done, or when there's sort of um, maybe some more negative energy going between people. So just as an example, if um, a fight has occurred at school. Um, and then you're able to offer for the students to sit down with a facilitator and talk through those issues, talk about the impact that the whole situation has had, and then work through that situation together, um, hopefully in a more positive space so that those students can continue to see each other at school um, and work through something like that. Thank you. Sure. And Katie, before we go on, can you say a little bit about um, how we how we how we moved? Like I've said that we're, we've been responsive to all of the changes that have been expected um, lately, and we should be responsive to students' needs. How did we respond going from in-person counseling to virtual? Yeah, um, and I would say that was a uh, challenging process, but one that was so important for our students. Um, that were both virtual or, um, again, kind of going back and forth because I've had lots of students on my caseload that have gone from in person and then they go off into the virtual learning academy and then they're back again or they're off um, for those school closures. So um, whereas we were doing more phone-based support during the first closure of the last school year, 
um, prior to this school year starting, we've talked about virtual support as something that we would be needing. So we had training, School Mental Health Ontario um, provided training on something called Brief Digital Intervention. Um, that's through Harvard University. They have a program. Um, so they had three different programs that we can share with our students. And they're not just ones they can do at home. There's also like in session with a counselor. So uh, there's Project Calm, Project Think, and Practicing the Opposite, which is exactly what it sounds like. Instead of avoiding going to school, try going to school and seeing how it, how it works. Um, so we had training in that, which we call BDI, Brief Digital Intervention. We had to develop protocols in line with the College of Social Workers around confidentiality and providing consent and all those considerations, whereas normally I would have just seen a student in my office. Now they're at their house, so we have to think about what happens if the call gets dropped. How are we going to ensure your safety? Those sorts of things. Um, we got some tangible um, support added in the sense that we had um, new computer programming that allowed us to get our consents signed by parents at home um, for those students that aren't in the building. So we're able to do digital signatures. Um, and then we also got training. So our group decided we um, wanted training from um, Leanna Lowenstein on tips and tricks for um, online counseling with youth. And then we also got some count, uh, training on how to use Teams with our students. That's the platform that we use doing online counseling with students. Um, so there was lots of stuff that we that we did in order to be able to provide that service. Um, and I would say it was probably not much later than the end of September that I was starting virtual support with with students. Um, and it's been really nice, actually. And just as a, a, a quick plug for my for my great team, um, I was on a ministry call this morning and the ministry asked how many people last summer um, did their staff actually um, take advantage? So during during the summer when they're off, take advantage of this training. And the great thing that I could say is that all my staff took advantage of this training so that they were prepared for this um, for September for this school year. So that was that was really terrific. I'll go to the next slide. Yes, please. OK. Um, and then I'm going to speak more about our wellness checks. So uh, as PLA mentioned in that resource team process is how we typically get our referrals to work with students and families. So there's actually different um, referral reasons for referral uh, when we're working with the kids. So it could be short term counseling um, or it could be a risk assessment, that sort of thing. So we added wellness checks um, as a reason for a referral. Um, that started again during the first school closure last year in March um, and then actually was able to continue into the summer as the ministry gave funding for um, summer social work support. So those were uh, students and families that uh, consented to the service that wanted that support and also um, wanted um, to be able to get some support around uh, transitioning back to school. Uh, mental health support, connection to resources, that sort of thing. Because we didn't have the virtual care options that we do now, it was mostly phone support. And then now during this second school closure from December till February, I was actually um, getting many more um, families and students interested in doing things like the Teams meeting. So when you talk about security, um, you're able to know, even though these kids aren't in the building every day, if they were in face-to-face -face learning, that we have somebody that can reach out to them um, and make sure that they either have connection to support um, or they're doing okay, or maybe they just need to vent about what's going on. Um, so that was something that we've been able to offer. Uh, I think just in the second shutdown, um, I had about seven or eight referrals for families uh, for wellness checks. So it was really helping to make sure that there weren't just people out there floundering, um, but that we could really provide that support um, even when schools weren't physically open. Um, and then the oh, next sorry. slide, I, I'll have Rachel take over and talk a little bit more about the, what the child and youth workers were doing around um, that sense of security. So hello everyone, my name is Rachel G and I'm a school child and youth worker here at the Grand Erie District School Board. And I first want to just say thank you so much for the opportunity. It's 
it really means a lot to me to be able to come here and share with you some of the amazing things that our child and youth work team has really put together in the last year as a way to really respond to the needs of our students. So this has been such a unique year and we've really put together some special things to really help out in a year that has been difficult for everyone. So one of the first initiatives that I really wanna share with you is our self-reg schools. So child and youth workers throughout the board um, are delivering professional development in designated schools to promote the work of Dr. Stuart Shanker and Dr. Susan Hopkins. This professional de de development opportunity includes six PowerPoint discussions delivered through the year to educators focusing on the need to assist students in learning self-regulation. So Katie's already talked a little bit about how self-regulation is so important. And we really are encouraging educators to make spaces and relationships safe in every way. This includes culturally, emotionally, physically, and socially. Shanker insists we must continuously look for links to connect relations, relationally to each child so they know that we care. So for me in my school, my Shanker school is King George, which is an elementary school uh, in Brantford. And I'm really, de I'm delivering this uh, PD at staff meetings. So every month I go in and I share with the entire staff how self-regulation can really help in their, in their classroom and what they can do to really make students feel safe, secure, and connect with them because that's the way we can really begin to help them with regulating their behavior. So on the right hand side there, you can see a flyer that we created um, that we provided to staff um, as well as administrators before we started the rollout. So they would just have a, a good idea of what to expect and how we were really gonna roll out this professional development. Uh, and if you see at the very bottom, bottom there, it says, see a child differently and you see a different child. And that sums up Shanker pretty well. That and the other uh, quote that I love is the one that there's no such thing as a bad kid, which really means we're just trying to look at their behaviors differently and really see what they need. And what that often boils down to is a place where they say, feel safe and secure. Go ahead for the next slide, please. Another program uh, that we have delivered is our Mask Up Superheroes. So when we were returning to school in February, uh, it there was the decision that all students were gonna be required to wear masks all day, every day, and even out for recess. So some of our educators, especially at the kindergarten level, came to us and they said, oh, we can see how this might be a struggle for some of our littlest students. So the child and youth workers jumped in and we thought to ourselves, you know what, we're gonna create a lesson where we can really provide students with an idea of how important it is to wear their masks every day. So the purpose of the lessons was to explain that every student needed to wear a mask in order to keep everyone safe and healthy. The lessons were designed to address uncomfortable feelings associated where, with wearing that mask. Because we knew for some of our little ones, this was gonna be hard. Um, the child and youth workers use puppets and we also had them practice their problem solving skills using role, role plays. So at the bottom of the screen at the right, you can see my little puppet there that's Twiggles and he had a mask on. And then on the bottom left, you can see um, the certificates. So every student that took part in our Mask Up Superheroes lesson received a certificate. And let me tell you, kindergarten students especially are so proud when you give them any kind of certificate. <laughs> and we thought that that was just a great way to really bring a positive spin to wearing a mask all day. And they were so cute. I'm, I mean, it was, it was really great. Next slide, Piali. Another program uh, that was created 
in mind to ha have students have a safe return to school was our Super Self Reg. And this was really one of my favorites. Super Self Reg um, was something that two of our child and youth workers created in the summer months to help students transition back to school when we came back to school in September. It was a five week program and it really focused on addressing uncomfortable feelings that students might be feeling and provide them, and provide them with a toolkit of strategies to help them deal with any kind of anxiety or fear that they might be feeling. We read several different great books. One you can see down below that says when worry takes hold. And they also had an opportunity to not only learn several tools, but also keep them and take them home with them as part of their toolkit. So the superhero stretch is just one of many examples that they received. And at the end of the five weeks, every student received a stress ball. And this was a big deal. Let me tell you, when kids got their stress balls, they were just thrilled. So originally I had planned and uh, created resources to deliver Super Self Reg in six of my schools. I thought that was a good start. And what happened was the kids loved it. All the CYWs, we dressed up and we all had our capes and um, the kids loved it. And before I knew it, teachers were stopping <laughs> me in the hallways and they were saying, hey, you know that, that program where you dress up like a superhero? We want that. So in the end, I ended up delivering Super Self Reg in nine schools. And I ended up having one, two, one um, small group, which is at the tier two level. So that means I took a small group of students out and we worked on the skills and we did some role plays and we did a little extra work so they could really just grasp and understand the lessons that were taught in class. At the end of our small group, that's where we created the glitter bottles that you can see at the bottom right hand corner. It got a little messy, I'm not gonna lie, there was glitter everywhere, but the kids loved it. And the glitter bottles turned out great. And again, it's just another opportunity to make those kids feel safe and to make that connection. And they just had a great time with it. And it's a funny little story that I have to say. Today, I was at King George and I had a kid yelling down the hallway to me, Super G, Super G, because that was my superhero name when I had a super cape on for Super Self Reg. <laughs> And I'm pretty sure in two of my three schools, I will be known as Super G for the rest of my life. But you know what? I'm okay with that because it was just such a fun program. And I'm going to turn it back to Katie now. Thanks, Rachel. My, um, I was telling the group that um, my son uh, did this program, the Super Self Reg program, and came home with a stress ball full of Orbeez and was, you know, I said, that's a really cool stress ball. And he said, you know about stress balls? And I said, yeah, I know about stress balls. So it was just really cool as a parent to see him um, carrying the language in uh, back to home uh, and learning about what he was learning about at school. Um, so we've talked about what we do uh, from at the school board as far as co-regulation and helping foster that sense of security. This is actually a direct cutout of one of the slides from the BDI, the Brief Digital Interventions Program. Um, this one is Project Calm uh, around calming skills. So uh, it's essentially saying that Michael Phelps used a strategy of deep breathing when he was feeling frustrated or upset, and he taught it to his young son. And at one point when he was feeling frustrated, his son recognized it and told him to take a deep breath. Um, so just a really nice example, um, even of what we're doing in, with our uh, young people to show them how co-regulation can work between um, adults and young people. Uh, so to wrap up security on the last slide for this section, uh, what do we know and what can we do around security? So uh, hopefully through this, you've learned more the importance uh, of feeling secure and how important it is before we're able to develop our other skills, our cognitive skills, social skills, all the things that we need to be learning at school, um, and the importance of modeling calm. 
So again, as I mentioned with walking in the school, it means being sort of aware of your own thoughts and emotions. And that doesn't mean to be a perfect parent or caregiver. It doesn't mean that you can't have bad days. It may be just saying, though, I'm having a bad day right now, and this is how I'm going to get through it. So modeling that problem solving when you're feeling upset. Um, we can help our young people by acknowledging their fears and validating feelings. So probably like the what not to do is to say, don't worry about that. That never helps anybody to say that. Um, but things like, I can tell you're worried. I can tell you that you've been thinking about this. Really validating their feelings um, can help to feel heard um, and to know that you're aware of what's going on for them. Focusing on coping skills, which is basically just how we manage stress and emotions. So again, you can say as a parent or caregiver, this is what I do to take care of myself um, and, and modeling that for them. Uh, keeping a routine and teaching healthy lifestyle habits as best we can. And then again, that important role that we have in co-regulating and helping our young people to go from here down to here. Uh, so for our next section of belonging, um, I'll pass it again over to Rachel. I was muted. I'm sorry. Thank you, Katie, so much. And just like safety and security is so important, so is the sense of belonging. We want all our students to feel like they belong when they're at school. Because not only students, but all people have an inherent need to belong. So for students to feel like they belong at school, they must feel connected to their school and the strength of the relationship with educators and the relationship they have with peers is so important. A sense of belonging supports students' effort, concentration, memory, and many other cognitive tasks. So the Ontario Student Drug Use Health Survey for 2019 reported that most students felt positively connected to their school. And although I, I look at the statistics and I say, you know what, that's pretty awesome. Most, feel, most students are feeling like they belong. To me, I feel like that means we still have work to do because I want every student in all my schools to feel like they belong. Next slide, Yali. So some of the things that we're doing at Grand Erie in all our tiers to promote belonging. Uh, every staff in the board had an opportunity to do professional development when we returned to school in September that was really there to welcome back students and we learned about mental health, equity and bullying prevention. The Safe and Inclusive Schools team also created two webinars that related to promoting belonging and they were allies for equality in education and creating safe and included inclusive spaces. Child and youth workers at the tier one level are providing social emotional learning programs and healthy relationships to classrooms throughout the board. Child and youth workers also uh, created self-regulation and self-care calendars during distance learning, which I'm gonna talk about in just a minute. And also child and youth workers, our offices are in school buildings. We model co connection for teachers and students every day. That might be as simple as saying good morning, smiling and making kids feel like they are really comfortable and that somebody cares about them. At the tier two level, We've talked about this a little bit already. Child and youth workers are providing small group support. So once kids are already going through or students are already going through the classroom presentations, then a teacher can say, you know what? I have a few students in my class that would really benefit from a little additional support. That happens at the tier two level. And at Tollgate, Ooh. which is one of our high schools in Brantford, uh, one of our child and youth workers and a social worker has worked so hard at creating a great drop-in center where our high school students can go to feel safe and just have that spot where they can get a little support and they feel like they belong. At the tier three level, that's where our social workers really come in. Social workers are providing support to vulnerable students in our buildings, in our classrooms, and they're also 
providing virtual social work support in the VLA for that virtual learning academy for those students that are learning from home. On the occasion, child and youth workers are also asked and required to provide social emotional learning programs for those students that have already been through the classroom. They've done the small group and they just need that one-on-one -on -one individual coaching where maybe they're doing role plays and they're really working on some one-on-one -on -one support. Go ahead, Kelly. So one of the things that the child and youth work team um, did during distant learning in 2020, so that would have been when we went off last March, is we felt it was imp super important to encourage students and families to continue doing activities that would promote self-care and self-regulation. So child and youth workers created 10 weekly calendars that were placed on the Grand Erie uh, website that fostered healthy relationships and promoted wellness during these challenging times. The self-regulation calendars can be found at the Grand Erie website under parent resources, weekly special education resources, and I've also included them in this PowerPoint as direct links. So after the presentation, if you would like, you can go on and you can simply click on any of the links down below and they will bring you up to some of the activities that you can do at home with your families and with your students and your children to really pr promote that wellness. So down below, uh, we, I have one example and that's one of our self-care calendars. And you can see on the left, that they're divided into the days of the week. And under each day, we have different activities. And I just wanna point out that every Friday on the self-care calendars is social self-care. So that's where we're really trying to provide activities that bring out that sense of belonging. We really wanted students when they were learning from home to find a way to connect to the people that mattered in their lives. So in that, example there, it says, connect with someone that's important to you. It could be over Teams or through Skype, where you can have conversation and share some of the great things that happened in your day and ask them to share some of the awesome things that happened in their day as well. Because sometimes we find when we were learning distance ed, everyone was focused on how hard it was and some of the negatives. So we just wanted to create activities where people were starting to think about what are the positives? What is something good that happened in the last week? And you want to celebrate them and share them with the people that mean the most to you. So I had Piali. Could I just interrupt you for a minute? I'm sorry I have to leave. I really enjoyed what I've heard and I look forward I, do, will you send us some of these um, um, posters or diagrams, whatever whatever they are, um, uh, lists? Um, I found them very helpful. So uh, please excuse me and uh, all the best. No problem. We'll Thank provide, you, Dave. Well, sorry. We'll provide the PowerPoint to you, Dave. All right. I think this is still uh, Rachel, right? Yes, it is. Thank you. So one of the other things that child and youth workers do is we're always teaching social emotional learning skills. So belonging is greatly impacted by positive peer relationships. We know that. To strengthen peer relationships, it can be useful to have discussions and instruction about social emotional learning skills. So the five categories of social emotional learning include self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Child and youth workers throughout the Grand Erie District School Board spend most of our time providing tier one classroom support in the form of evidence-based social emotional learning programs. That means these are social emotional learning programs that are created outside our board and that we purchase and then child and youth workers simply deliver them as they were created. 
Uh, 195 social emotional learning programs have been delivered in person or virtually throughout the current school year. And I think that's just a fantastic number. Uh, part of the social emotional learning programs that we are uh, delivering is our PAS program. So PAS stands for the Promoting Alternative Thinking Strategies. And each child and youth worker is delivering it in at least one grade one classroom. It's a year long program that consists of 52 lessons. And it's, it's just one of the great ways that gets us into our younger primary classrooms. And we're really starting to teach these skills at a preventative level. In addition to, our, um, to teaching those paths at the primary level, Many CYWs are also teaching PAS 4 in junior classrooms and connecting with others in junior and intermediate classrooms. So for me personally, not only am I teaching PAS in a grade one, two class, I'm also teaching PAS 4 in two junior classrooms and I'm teaching connecting with others at the moment in six uh, junior classrooms. So, that to me is just fantastic because these students are really learning the skills that they need to have healthy relationships. And these are skills that they're gonna have for the rest of their lives. So I actually asked, I asked um, Rachel to show us um, and to give us a little bit of a demonstration of one of the, one of the things that they learned through PATH, which is called turtling. So, now you have to be patient with me because now I'm going to be slightly tacky, only slightly. For some reason, it's not letting me stop the program. See, this is where my slightly tacky doesn't work. Okay, let me try it this way and see if it works. Okay, so now I'm going to let Rachel, um, you'll see her there, and be able to sort of show you um, what's called turtling. I love turtling. And I just wanted to show her, have, have her have a chance to show it to you all. Yeah, absolutely. So turtling is three steps. The first step to doing the turtle is to tell yourself to stop. So we tell our students in grade one to put their hand up and tell themselves to stop. The second step is always to take one deep breath. And you'll really see the students, they'll breathe in and they breathe out. And then the third step is to say the problem and how you feel. And honestly, it is awesome when you start to see it in the classrooms, because you'll see the students and they'll go, I need to stop. And then they'll take a breath and they breathe out. And then they'll say, Sarah just took my pencil and I feel really mad. And it just makes you say, Yes, they're getting this. They're starting to pick up the language. And we also say to the teachers, you know what, really give them that positive feedback. We have all kinds of turtle stickers. So every time, every time, no matter what's going on around you in the classroom, when you see someone doing the, stir the turtle, stop and celebrate it. Give them a sticker and be like, oh, you're doing the turtle. And before you know it, it starts to catch on. And all the students are doing the turtle. And before you know it, even at times when they're not doing the turtle, the teachers start saying, you should try to do the turtle. And that's how we really see the language start to change in our classrooms. And then once our students have went through the PAS program, they might be even in grade two and grade three. And we start to see it in the whole school because their younger siblings might be doing PAS and then they say, I did the turtle at home and my brother said, I used to do the turtle. And we start to see this like super positive change. And it's something like Piali said, it gets me so excited. <laughs> That's lovely, Rachel. Thank you very much. See, isn't it great to have such beautiful enthusiasm? I'll tell you. Okay, um, just before, just while I put the slides back on, and I'm hoping you can all see it. 
Yep. Yep. Okay. Terrific. I'll also tell you that I had a parent who uh, contacted me to let me know that um, she had, um, uh, there had been a loss and she was really struggling with it and she was crying and uh, her little daughter uh, who had been taking the PADS program uh, sort of tugged on her skirt and said, turtle mom, turtle, you'll feel better if you turtle. Like what a what an absolutely lovely, lovely story. All right. I'm going to move it over. Is it over to Katie? Nope, it's, nope, still, it's me. still me. Okay. Can I'm not sure that people can see you. I apologize for that. But you can see the slide. So I think I'm just gonna go with that for now. You can see the you slide, see the and, slide I should be and I should the bottom, be at the bottom of the screen. It shifted when I when I came back in. I came back in a different way. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. We can still we see can you. still see you. Oh, can you? It's just me then. Yeah, yeah. And there may be a, <laughs> bit, of may be a bit of feedback. <laughs> I am. I am. I am hearing a little, hearing a little bit of feedback, feedback too. So, so social emotional social learning, learning, learning is also, also taught. taught at the tier two and the and the Yali. Yali. Yes. Maybe maybe you, your, you, microphone, your microphone. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's yes. Okay. Uh, now for me to do that now, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe here. Let me do that. I can also mute. Okay. Sorry, I'm gonna have to take a minute to Go back in, but I think that is the solution for me to mute my microphone. It wasn't a, it wasn't wasn't a problem before, before but, but for some reason, for some it, is reason now. it is now. Thank you, thank you. All right. All right. So social, so emotional, social emotional, I still hear, I still a, little hear a little bit of echo. We will just we will just go go forward and see forward if it, and see if it works itself out works itself out. So so social emotional social learning emotional is learning also taught, is also taught at the tier at the tier two, two and the and tier the tier level. Is Jason is Jason there? Is that something that, that he can that he can make you with? Putting, I'm putting myself back on for a second. Maybe we could have everybody ensure that their microphones are um, off. We could try that. Yeah, everybody's, yeah, everybody's microphone, microphone has been off. Has been off. Okay. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know what the problem is. What is, the problem Jason is. is Jason there? Well, I think we'll have to sort of patiently persevere. Sure, sure. Uh, sorry, I'm going to have to try to do mine again because I put mine back on. <laughs> now, I, I don't now, think you're the cause. I don't think you're the cause. Yeah, I, yeah, I think you're fine. Are you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Are we so ready? Are we ready to give it a go? Give it a go. So once so here, one here, classroom, classroom, classroom support, support has been initiated, the classroom teacher can request tier two support in the form of small groups during an in-school team meeting. A small group is a great way to reinforce the learning that's already occurred in the classroom. Select few who would benefit from a little more additional instruction. As students and staff increase their social emotional learning, they begin to use common language and that can be heard throughout the building. Another little example is one of my learning resource teachers said that a student came to them and said, I was having problems at recess and I tried to use an I statement. And I said, I feel frustrated when you only play soccer with everyone else. And she said, I thought to my, and she, the student said to the LRT, can you tell Miss G I'm really trying? And the LRT said to me, this is fantastic. The kids are really starting to get it. And that, those are the part, the times that just make my heart so happy. And I think, you know what, what, what we're doing is so meaningful and it's making a difference in these students' lives. So 7,522 students 
throughout the board have taken part in either tier one or tier two child and youth work support in the current year. And when I heard that number, I'm like, you know what? That's impressive. That's That says something about our new model because we're reaching so many. Individual one-on-one -on -one coaching can also be requested after the completion of small groups to reinforce material. All right, Piali, next slide, please. And that echoing worked itself out, so hallelujah. So what do we know and what can we do? In general, we are all social beings and relationships give us comfort. They help us manage stress and they act as protective factors to enhance our well-being. To remain healthy and safe, we have had to be physically distant from others. And this has impacted our physical and cognitive, emotional and social wellness. We have to, we have to, admit that that's the case. The good thing is people have been very creative in the many ways that they have tried to stay connected to friends and family and those actions are super important. One of my dear friends turned 30 during the last lockdown and instead of going out, which we would have done, we had a Teams group or a Zoom party and we played trivia and we made origami. So it, it was a little different, but you know, it was still great. We were creative and we connected and that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. But it is also important. It's also important to acknowledge, even if it's temporary, the loss of social connection and belonging. So when you're with your children, you want to acknowledge the fact that they may have feelings of loss and frustration and loneliness. And keep reminding your, your children that this is temporary. If we, we remain creative to what we've learned during this difficult time, and we remember the importance of feeling safe and connected and hopeful, we can recover from this pandemic. And that's what's so important. And now I'm going to pass it back to Katie to talk a little bit about hope. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so our last, um, we've talked about security, we've talked about belonging, and then finally, um, we talk about hope. So when we think about what is hope, um, sort of a way to, to think about it that was helpful for me is when we think about an optimistic person um, believes that kind of somehow, whether that's through dumb luck, whether that's through the actions of someone else or the actions of themselves, that the future will end up being successful and fulfilling versus a hopeful person believes in their own capacity to have a successful future. So that's kind of the difference if you can think of it that way, when it mean, what it means to have hope. Um, Snyder is another uh, psychologist that had a theory around hope that um, hopefulness is comprised of uh, goals thinking, so being able to have valuable goals, pathways thinking, so having the capacity to develop strategies to reach those goals, and then agency thinking, so the ability to initiate um, and sustain the motivation to use those strategies. Um, so when we know that hope is present um, with somebody, we see that they have improved coping, they have um, more healthy behaviors that they're doing, um, and we see it builds resiliency, which just means that challenging life events are less intense. Um, and it's a it's a huge protective factor when it comes to um, mental health. So for me, when I'm doing, for instance, a suicide risk assessment with a student, if I can get a sense that they have hope there, um, that's a huge protective factor versus if they've gotten to the point where there's that hopelessness, they don't kind of see um, at some point the future getting better. Uh, hope has been really ingrained into the recovery model around mental health. So that's when we think about addictions uh, and mental health recovery. 
so our job as clinicians and caregivers is to be instilling hope in people um, and fostering hope in whatever ways we can that somehow things will get better, which is so important right now. Um, so the next slide, please. Thank you. So how we're fostering hope within the school board, um, again, starting down at tier one, there's been um, resources for staff. So this has been lots of focus on, on our students, but we know that this has been obviously a challenging year for everybody, including staff. Um, so there's been um, supports available. Uh, one was a safe schools webinar that was called Beyond Coping, Living with COVID-19. Um, next week, there is a wonderful speaker, Dr. Robin Defoe, who's going to be providing um, some uh, professional development to staff called Everyday, Everyday Resiliency and Ever-Changing Time. So she talks about these five pillars um, of resiliency. Uh, so very well connected to this feeling of hope. Um, the CYWs are doing virtual wellness lessons, which Rachel will speak on in a second. And then, for instance, um, us as the social workers and child and youth workers also do this too, is help connection to community support and doing referrals. So as an example, one service that we can do for families is a connection to um, a mental health, telemental health referral. So that's an appointment done by video um, with a child psychiatrist. And when we're able um, to sort of assess, is this service needed for this student um, and you're talking with the parent who was thinking they would need to go through this lengthy wait time between going to family doctor trying to obtain a referral to a psychiatrist to just say no we can kind of facilitate that on our end for it's a one-time appointment it's not like an ongoing um, psychiatry support um, but you see the hope in people that okay I, I'm not feeling like there's no help for this um, same with when I'm working um, up in tier three with my individual students. It's finding ways that I can build hope into those conversations and knowing um, that, yes, we have the skills to help you with this. Uh, one of the other um, kind of modalities that we use that we got training on from School Mental Health Ontario was called BRISC, uh, which is basically just brief interventions for school clinicians. Um, and they build that feeling of hope right into their, um, it's, it's a pretty prescriptive program that you use as a clinician with students and hope is built into this, the very first session. Um, so always remembering that, especially when it comes to things like my students struggling with anxiety and depression to say, I can help you with that. Like that's treatable. And there are lots of people that live with an anxiety diagnosis that can do really well. Um, and can function better than you may be functioning right now. And so it's giving people hope that this doesn't have to be the way they're feeling, doesn't have to be forever. Things can get better. And if they don't have hope within themselves, it's what can we do as their caregivers, as their um, helpers at school to build that feeling of hope within them, to foster the hope and really grow it into something bigger, which is so important right now. So to talk more about the virtual wellness lessons, Rachel, if you could Take it from here. Yes, so the virtual wellness lesson was something that the child and youth workers created uh, when we were working from home this winter. So January and February of this year. And we created several wellness lessons that were delivered virtually to students who were online learning. So we would attend their everyday classroom and we would go to the Teams meeting and we would deliver these lessons. They were created to support uh, our students who were on the virtual learning academy as well. Gratitude was just one of several of the lessons that we delivered at the primary, junior, and, and as well at the intermediate and secondary level to bolster, bolster hope during such a challenging time. Much of the material I should mention was covered that was covered in our virtual lessons was also covered in our mental health literacy programs that were available at our high, for our high school students. A lot of what I've talked about today has been uh, geared to our elementary students, so I thought it was important to highlight that we're also in our secondary schools and we're really supporting that mental health literacy. Uh, we've de delivered 14 classroom presentations in the current year. But going back to the gratitude. We, we had these lessons where we wanted students to take some time and think about what they were grateful for. Um, 
from the primary lesson, I pulled out this one slide and we talked about the things that they could do every day to bolster that sense of hope or the gratefulness. We talked about creating a gratitude jar, maybe at home or even in the classroom, where they could go back at the end of the year and really reflect on the things that they're grateful for. We also talked about doing acts of kindness and just looking around us at the things that give us hope or grateful, make us feel grateful every day. Back to you, Katie. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, to sum up this section, so we know that hope um, gives us the ability to be resilient and cope with difficult life events. And the nice thing about that is it builds on itself. So once a person has been able to go through something like this and make it out on the other side okay, then it's like, okay, the next time I'm faced with something challenging, I know I've had the skills to get through it. Even though it was hard, I made it. Um, so though that's really important um, as sort of a foundation of how we navigate through the world around us. So what can we do, especially at home, to kind of help develop that feeling of hope? So first, as Rachel mentioned, practicing gratitude. So you can build that in however it makes sense in your day. Some families, you know, do that before their meal or share different things. Um, if you're able to eat together as a family or maybe it's on the way to school or on, um, on the Sunday night, thinking about what we're looking forward to um, and things that we're thankful for. And it doesn't have to be... You know, I know it's hard right now for people financially and, and a lot of the things that we were looking forward to are canceled or impacted, but it can just be, I'm looking forward to another day. I'm looking forward to the nice weather this weekend. I'm looking forward to getting outside for a walk. It doesn't have to be tangible things. It can be even just the smallest things. And sometimes being grateful and pointing out to kids that even the small things we can be grateful for, the more small things, the more things you can find. So I'm thankful for the clouds. I'm thankful for the sun. I'm thankful for, um, you know, the ability to breathe, all these sorts of little things that we want to focus on. Um, again, focusing on strengths wherever we can and pointing out our successes wherever we can. And then finally, as best as you can, limiting media exposure. Um, with everything that's going on right now, it also, you know, can increase that feeling of insecurity. Um, and I just know as myself, um, kind of being a more sensitive person, the more I watch the news, I feel it. I feel more hopeless. Um, so just being careful around what we're consuming, especially around young people, that can be even more hypersensitive. Again, I put in the link for School Mental Health Ontario because I find it such a great resource. Um, it has stuff for parents, for educators, for kids. Um, so there's lots of great stuff in there. And some of it is very specific to COVID-19 and things that you can be doing as a family. I just wanted to check in with the group because it's um, eight minutes to eight, and this ends at eight o'clock. Uh, so normally we were supposed to have a break. Our people, we can sort of um, finish up by showing the last couple of slides. Where are people at? Can people hear me? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just want to make sure. Are, are people okay? Like, like we can't. I don't. Want, I want to respect the fact that people don't probably want to go much past eight. Um, so, are people? You know, are people okay if we sort of finish up the last couple of slides? I think that would be yeah. fine. fine. Yes. Okay. All right. Then I think that's. I think that's where we're going to go. Um, uh, Rachel, I'm going to ask you just to briefly sort of introduce uh, the five ways to well-being, uh, and then um, hopefully our video <laughs> will work, and we can um, we can take any questions that people may have at that point. So let me go back to the slides. Okay. All right. All right. Oh, I'll turn off my mic. So, so for mental for health, health this, week, this week, 
or sorry, this, sorry year, this year, we are focusing, we are focusing on the on five, five ways, ways to well-being. To well-being. And, and mental health mental week, health is, week gonna is gonna take place, take place between, May between May 3rd and May 9th. And May 9th. So each, so day, each day, the mental, the health, mental team health team will be in, will class be in classroom classroom and supporting, and supporting the virtual, the virtual learning, learning academy, academy with, specific with specific activities, activities to, promote to promote the five, the five ways, of ways of well-being. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, Lee, can, yeah, we, Lee, can we get, slide, slide. are you having are problems? You having problems? All right. All right. So, so five, five ways, ways well being, being. include include give, give be, active, be active, keep learning, keep learning, connect, connect, and take and notice. take notice. Activities, Activities plan, plan encourage encourage connecting. connecting. So for our so primary, for our primary students, students, we're gonna have we're gonna them have them either draw, draw or write or a letter. Write a letter to family, to family and family members, members or friends, or friends telling, them telling them why they are, they special, are special or what or makes, what them, makes important them important to them. To them. For, our For our older students, older students we, thought we thought a photo, a photo challenge, challenge might be fun. Where they could, where they find, could find take, take photos, take photos that, remind that remind them of those, of those they feel, they connected, feel connected, to. connected to. Next slide. Next slide. Activities, Activities plan, plan to encourage being, being active. active. An outdoor, An outdoor dance, party dance party is the one, is that, the I one thought, that I ooh, thought, ooh, I'm doing that, I'm doing one, that with one with kids. Uh, staying, uh, active staying active bingo, bingo is, also is also an activity, an activity for, for primary, primary students, students because, because all, all students, students love bingo. Bingo. Next slide. Next slide. Activity activity and plan for taking, taking, notice notice taking notice is mindful, is mindful activities. activities. We have some we have really some great, really great mindfulness, mindfulness videos, videos uh, planned, uh, planned that are that often are from often Google, 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 out of paper, out of paper and, then they, and then they can draw, they can draw new, new words to words show to show their things they are grateful for. For our older for our students, students, we have a great have TED, a great talk, TED plan, talk plan where, where 10 mindful minutes is, is really is really what it's gonna encourage. It's gonna encourage. Next slide. Next slide. Activities, Activities plan, plan, plan to learn learning. learning. Is a show is a and show share. and share. So this is so where this is where students can students either can either find something find that something helps that helps them feel mentally, feel mentally well, well, or, or they can share they something share they something they during the week. during the week of what of what five, five ways well. And one of my and one of my very favorite is the virtual scavenger scavenger hunt. Where older, where older students are encouraged, encouraged to find local, local mental, health mental health resources, resources crisis lines, lines web and apps. And apps. Either, either using some, some sort of, sort of uh, cell phone, cell phone or, or some sort of some sort of computer, computer or device. device. Next slide. Next slide. So, 
So, so activities, activities plans, plans to encourage, encourage giving. giving. These are some, These of, are my some of my favorites. Uh, we, uh, have, we have welcome and activity. activity. Students, students will be taught, taught about the difference, the difference in complement and how we and can how we can call the way the way someone acts, someone acts the way the way they look they look something they something have, they have or or something that something they do, that they do well. really well. And then and each then student each student pick a name and name out of a hat and then and they then they give, give, give another another student a compliment. compliment. Post post post, 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 post note, note is where is students, students will post it, post it, post it, and they'll think positive, 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 Sorry guys, uh, the the video, I don't know, for the last 15 minutes we've been having, or at least I've been having technical problems in playing um, the PowerPoint. So um, basically I'm gonna describe this to you. Basically we have a video that introduces the five ways to well-being. So these are the child and youth workers and the educators. We we've come together and we've introduced each one of these sort of simple but evidence-based like like uh, Rachel's already said the importance of connecting the importance of give the importance of keeping learning being active and uh, we have educators as well who join us on this um, video um, to talk about what they do in each one of these areas so rather than fiddle with this anymore at this time of night uh, I think you should know that it's it's in draft form. It's 98% done, um, but it will be ready and it will be put on the board YouTube channel um, by Mental Health Week. So that, I mean, really great job, uh, Katie and Rachel, just absolutely terrific at showing all um, the stuff that we do all the time. We just do this daily. Uh, are there any questions from the crowd? Hi, I, I'm, I'm Eva, Eva Dixon, Dixon, a trustee. I just want to say thank you very much. much. And I know I'm echoing. I know I'm echoing. Thank you. Thank you. You're more than welcome. We believe. We actually, I hope that comes across. I can't imagine that it didn't how much we believe in the work that we do. Is there anything else? All right. Um, sorry. Thanks, yeah, yeah. Sarah, would you, would you like, I wasn't sure if you wanted to finish off. Yes. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Um, I'd um, like to I'd thank like you to for thank you coming, for coming, um, Piala um, and Katie and Rachel, and all those who are able to come to watch tonight and those who will watch later. Um, really appreciate the time that we you put into creating this, and also the time and the love that you show for our kids and our students. Um, it really came across. Um, it made me sort of rethink my the way that I deal with my kids and and. You made me really realize um, that our CYWs and social workers uh, who work with the kids are in the right profession. Um, you guys are there for the right reasons. Um, and uh, that really came through tonight. We really appreciate you sharing all of that with us. Um, and I know I took a few notes um, on some ideas that we can I can bring to my home as well. So. Thank you very much, and I hope everybody has a good Easter weekend, and uh, we'll be back at school next week. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care.